Okay, well, um, if, if we don't have any last minute uh, questions, I suggest that we just uh, get started. By way of housekeeping, um, any questions can be posted in the Q&A pod. We will uh, take those as time allows at the end. The presentation slide deck is available for download in the files pod. By clicking on that uh, title, it should download a PDF copy right to your uh, desktop. Um, it will also be available at the end with the recording um, on the GIF website. As always, we have a survey online. The link to that is posted in the notes pod. Um, and without any further ado, we will go ahead and get started. Doing today's introduction is Dr. Patricia Pavier. Patricia is um, with the Department of Energy. She's also the chair of the GIF Education and Training Task Force. Patricia? Yes, thank you so much, Berta. Good morning, everybody. A pleasure to have Professor Craig Smith uh, with us today. He's a researcher, professor of physics at the Naval Postgraduate School. Monterey, California, and he received his PhD in nuclear science and engineering from the University of California, Los Angeles in 1975. He's a fellow of the American Nuclear Society and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He has research experience in nuclear energy, radiation detection, nuclear forensics. His previous employers include the U.S. Army, Science Applications International Cooperation, Booz Allen Hamilton, and Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, where he was a deputy associate director, and he led the Fission Energy Program. Uh, start beginning, uh, beginning in 2004, he became the, Los, the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory Chair Professor at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. He serves as the U.S. Observer Representative to the GIF Provisional System Steering Committee for the Lead Cool Fast Reactor. And without any delay, uh, I give you the floor, Greg. Thank you again for volunteering to give this webinar. Well, thank you, Patricia, for the kind introduction. And uh, welcome, everyone, to today's webinar uh, on the Lead Cooled Fast Reactor. Let me start by thanking the organizers of the webinar series and acknowledging the hard work and active involvement of the sponsors in making them a reality. At the outset, I'll say a few words about the physics and motivation for fast reactors in general, and then later discuss the specifics of the lead-cooled fast reactor. At present, nuclear reactors produce more than 10% of the world's electricity and much higher levels than that in several countries. For example, the level in France is 72%, Belgium 50%, in Korea 30%, in the United States 20%, and similar levels in many other countries. However, current thermal reactors use only about six-tenths of the energy value in the mined natural uranium. They produce long-life transuranics as nuclear waste or spent fuel, and they operate with a relatively low level of efficiency in conversion of their released energy into electricity, with typical power conversion efficiencies of about 33%. Gen 4 fast reactors, and the lead-cooled fast reactor in particular, can offer strong improvements to address these and other issues associated with current generation of reactors. Today's presentation provides some background on fast reactors and then a more detailed description of the development and current status of the LFR. So this slide shows the agenda for this webinar, and I'll start with a recap of the basic physics of fast reactors, recognizing that this may be a refresher for some, but for others it may represent important background. Next I'll discuss the characteristics and challenges of advanced LFRs and the historical development of the lead-cooled fast reactor within the Generation 4 and Generation 4 International Forum, or GIF, context. Following that, I'll describe the GIF reference system reactors and several additional LFR designs that are currently being developed. I'll wrap up with some summary comments and conclusions. So the, uh, first of all, a recap of fast reactor physics and their implications. Uh, this graphic 
courtesy of Dr. Bob Hill, who presented an earlier webinar on the sodium fast reactor, compares the neutron energy spectrum of uh, a fast reactor, in this case an SFR, sodium fast reactor, in green, and then, uh, and then a light re uh, water reactor, a uh, thermal spectrum reactor in red. Both the sodium fast reactor and the lead-cooled fast reactor are metal-cooled fast reactors, so the neutron uh, energy spectrum for an LFR would be similar to that shown in the green curve. Note that fission neutrons are born in a range of energies centered around 1 million electron volts, or, or slightly higher, as shown by the blue arrow on the right of this chart. In a thermal reactor, these fast uh, fission neutrons are moderated or slowed down to a very low uh, or thermal energies where thermal fission takes place around or below an energy of about one-tenth of an electron volt. Uh, note that this is an energy reduction of about seven orders of magnitude. So in thermal reactors, such as light water reactors, most of the fissions occur around the one-tenth one of an electron volt thermal peak that's shown in the red bump on the curve at the left. In fast reactors, such as lead-cooled fast reactors or sodium fast reactors, neutron energy moderation is avoided, and fissions occur mainly in the fast energy range uh, in the peak uh, at the right side of this chart. To delve into this a little further, consider the graph on the left of this view graph. This is a plot of fission cross-sections for uranium-235 and plutonium-239, the two most important fissile isotopes in either thermal or fast reactors. The term fissile means an atom that can be easily fissioned after absorbing a thermal or fast neutron. And a fission cross-section with units of Barnes is a measure of the likelihood of fission given an interaction with a neutron. On this graph, you can see the vertical band of energies in blue at the right side of the uh, chart on the left that represents the range of energies of neutrons that are, uh, uh, that are born by fission. If you look at, to the right of the graph, you will see that for uranium-235 and plutonium-239, the fission cross-sections at fast energies uh, of around a million electron volts, or MeV, are about one or a few barns, if you read the scale to the left. You will also see that for uranium-238, there is a similar cross-section for fission at energies higher than about one million electron volts, but essentially no chance of fission induced by neutrons of low energy. Now if you look to the left of the graph, you, you will see that in the uh, low thermal energies, the fission cross-sections for plutonium-239 and uranium-235 rise to levels around 1,000 barns. So fission cross-sections are nearly three orders of magnitude higher in thermal than in fast spectra. This in part indicates the favorable characteristic leading to widespread current use of thermal reactors, and it also indicates why the level of fuel enrichment in fast reactors are generally considerably higher than those in thermal reactors. Next, consider the graph on the right of this slide. This shows fission cross-sections in red and capture cross-sections in blue for plutonium-239. The curves are also similar for uranium-235. The ratio between these two values is very important since fission is a process providing not only energy but also neutrons needed to sustain the chain reaction while capture is a process that removes neutrons. So note that there is a sharp decrease in capture cross-sections at high energy, in, especially in comparison with the fission cross-section. This is where one of the main advantages of fast react reactors come in. The point is that neutron energy spectra have important implications for both fuel utilization and minor actinide consumption. The histogram on the left of this slide shows the ratio of fission to absorption for a number of important isotopes in reactor fuel. The red bars show this ratio for a thermal reactor, 
in this case a pressurized water reactor, and the blue bars for a fast reactor, in this case again a sodium fast reactor. Again noting that for a lead cooled fast reactor the results would be quite similar to those for the sodium fast reactor. The chart shows that the fissile isotopes uranium-235 and plutonium-239 are likely to fission in either thermal or fast spectra. The fertile isotopes, for example uranium-238, which is fertile in the sense that it can be converted to a fissile material, are more likely to fission in the fast spectrum. And this was also shown on the previous view graph where we noted that uranium-238 has an appreciable fission cross-section, but only for neutrons with high energy. Note also that higher actinides, for example, plutonium, neptunium, americium, and curium, which are responsible for much of the long-term radiotoxicity of spent nuclear fuel or high-level waste, are much more efficiently consumed in the fast spectrum than in the thermal spectrum. Now consider the chart on the right which shows a number of, the number of neutrons per fission as a function of the neutron energy. And you can see that for fast energies, around 1 million electron volts, the yield begins to climb considerably. So there are more excess neutrons available in the fast spectrum. The net result is better fuel utilization and significant actinide con uh, consumption in fast reactors. So what does this mean for sustainability of fast reactors? This chart shows the results of a recent set of calculations by a colleague of mine, Dr. Luciano Cianotti, to consider the potential impacts of fast reactor scenarios in the United Kingdom. The question was, what would be the annual nuclear material requirement needed to produce 100 terawatt hours of electricity, or 30% of the total annual electricity demand in the UK? Three scenarios are shown, the first being the scenario using thermal reactors without recycle of spent fuel, labeled on the slide as the baseline scenario. The second scenario being the use of fast reactors, uh, namely the lead-cooled fast reactor, with recycle of plutonium, but not the additional minor actinides. And the third scenario being fast reactors with full actinide recycle. In the first scenario, 2,100 tons of fresh natural uranium would be required annually. Of this material, 1,900 tons, labeled here with the letter A, would be set aside as depleted uranium, and 184 tons, labeled as B, would be left over as still enriched uranium in spent fuel. There would also be 2.6 tons of generated plutonium, labeled C. 0.38 tons of minor actinides, labeled D, and 13 tons of fission fragments accumulated in the spent fuel. Shifting to the second scenario, the new natural uranium feed would amount to only 10.8 tons per year in an equilibrium cycle, a factor of about 200 less than the first scenario, or none at all if all the accumulated uh, uh, the amounts from the legacy use of thermal reactors is considered. This would be the utilization of previously accumulated materials labeled A, B, and C. Note that in this second scenario, the new minor actinide generation is somewhat less than in the first scenario, and also that the fission product waste is considerably less. This is due mainly to the improved efficiency of power conversion in the postulated fast reactor system. The situation for the third scenario is similar to the second, except that the minor actinide recycle eliminates most of the minor actinide materials, which is an important consideration in the issue of high-level waste disposal. The takeaway here uh, is that fast reactors support enhanced sustainability of nuclear power relative to thermal reactors, uh, reactors through greatly improved uranium resource utilization and significantly amount, uh, reduced amount and radiotoxicity of high-level nuclear waste. It should be noted that sustainability and improved material management are not sufficient alone to drive successful development of new fast reactors, economic viability, safety excellence, and proliferation risk management are also essential. 
Up to now, we've been considering fast reactors in general. So now let's consider the lead-cooled fast reactor in particular. Why LFR technology? As with other fast reactors, LFRs offer significant advantages in sustainability and uranium utilization. In other words, better use of natural resources. They also offer the potential for dramatic reduction in the quantity and toxicity of high-level waste if full recycle or closed fuel cycle is used, as shown in the previous uh, calculation. Relative to other fast reactors, lead-cooled fast reactors have a unique combination of favorable features, uh, which include uh, a very high bo boiling point. It's 1,737 uh, degrees centigrade for molten lead. A relatively benign chemistry, uh, namely there are no rapid chemical reactions with water or air. Uh, a low vapor pressure, which enables operation at near atmospheric pressure. And excellent neutronic properties for fast spectrum operation. So these and other favorable features are inherent in the properties of lead, the lead coolant and can be exploited through proper plant design. A, a lead cooled fast reactor uh, design starting with the design of a sodium fast reactor and simply replacing the sodium with lead would uh, clearly not uh, be an optimal uh, design for an LFR. These uh, favorable features must be taken into account and exploited uh, in the design process. However, there are also challenges to address, and the first is corrosion pr potential. And this is the one that gets the most attention, so uh, I'll, I'll put it to the side for now and come back in a minute. Uh, other uh, challenges that need to be considered include the high melting or freezing point of lead, which is 327 degrees uh, centigrade. And this requires proper engineering to avoid lead freezing by maintaining a temperature margin above freezing point throughout the primary system. Another challenge relates to seismic or structural considerations due to the high density and weight of the coolant. Uh, the um, way that the, this issue uh, tends to be addressed is, first of all, through compact size, which uh, serves to mitigate the challenge uh, of the, the high mass levels. And in second um, case, uh, in some designs, seismic isolation is in integrated into the reactor system design. A further issue is the fact that lead is an opaque, high temperature coolant, and this has implications for in-service inspection as well as other operational requirements. The fact that there are similar in-service inspection issues and solutions with the sodium fast reactor, which is also an opaque, high temperature coolant, uh, so some of the methods developed for the sodium fast reactor will also apply to the lead-cooled fast reactor. An approach for several LFR concepts is to emphasize and implement accessibility and replaceability of components, which can allow for periodic uh, inspection out of the lead coolant. Finally, there are newer ac acoustic methods that are being discussed, studied, and appear to work well for lead-cooled systems. Coming back to the issue of corrosion, it's well known that lead and lead alloys are corrosive to conventional steels at high temperatures. Corrosion prevention can be achieved by operating at temperatures low enough to avoid such corrosion phenomena. Uh, for this condition, current materials could um, then be used. The temperature limit for this is generally taken to be about 480 degrees centigrade. A second approach is the use of advanced corrosion-resistant materials for higher temperature operation. New materials such as silicon or aluminum enhanced steels, uh, for example, alumina forming austenitic uh, steels and silicon enhanced steels is one approach. Finally, surface coating with corrosion protective materials for higher temperature operations, mainly for materials associated with the uh, uh, fuel cladding and steam generator components or functionally graded composite materials, uh, a technology under development at MIT also show promise. Coating is of particular interest mainly for fuel cladding or for heat exchanger tubes. An R&D qualification program for the use of such coatings is necessary to demonstrate mechanical stability, adhesion to the substrate, and so on, under relevant operating conditions, which can include neutron irradiation. 
A key factor in most designs involves maintaining a metal oxide film on metal structures by controlling the coolant oxygen within a range that is below the concentration for lead oxide formation and above the minimum concentration needed for sustaining a protective oxide coating of the component services, surfaces. In general, these challenges are technical in nature and can be overcome through proper design, engineering, and R&D. Current reactor designs being considered feature different approaches uh, or even combinations of approaches to corrosion con control. And in many cases, the, uh, multiple approaches are used depending on which component and what temperature range the uh, reactor is designed to operate in. This slide provides a few comparative details for selected liquid metal coolants. The first is lead bismuth. Uh, this is a lead-based coolant for some LFR designs, then lead, and then sodium. Lead bismuth, which is also referred to as LBE, or lead bismuth eutectic, has a melting point of 125 degrees centigrade and a boiling point of 1,670. Pure lead has a, both a higher melting point of 327 centigrade and a boiling point of 1,737 degrees. Both of these lead-based coolants are practically inert in terms of chemical reactivity with water and air. And this has important favorable implications for the design, safety, and economic potential of LFRs. Sodium is also included on this chart for comparative purposes. Sodium has a lower melting point, but also a substantially lower boiling point. The, the high chemical reactivity of sodium with water and air stands in contrast with the characteristics of lead coolants. So lead and le lead bismuth eutectic coolants provide promising overall characteristics, while sodium technology is more highly developed, having received much greater R&D attention over the past 60 years. Having mentioned LBE, let me say a few words about the lead versus LBE choice. First, lead-cooled fast reactors can be cooled by either pure lead or by the alloy mixture of lead and bismuth, LBE, uh, or lead bismuth eutectic. Uh, with, uh, LBE is the alloy of these two elements, lead and bismuth, with uh, a composition that's approximately 55% bismuth and 45% lead. The major advantage of LBE over lead is that it has a much lower melting or freezing point, 125 degrees centigrade for bismuth, uh, for, for lead bismuth, versus 327 degrees centigrade for lead. And this reduces the engineering difficulties and, and allows lower temperature operation. And those are the major advantages. On the other hand, uh, LBE in the presence of neutrons produces polonium-210, through the reaction shown in red on this view graph. Bismuth-209, the primary uh, bismuth uh, isotope, uh, it reacts with a neutron to produce bismuth-210, which is a beta emitter with a five-day half-life uh, that uh, ultimately decays into polonium-210. Polonium-210 is an alpha emitter with a 138-day half-life. And it's a, pot a potent and radiotoxic alpha emitter uh, and, and that uh, toxicity is one of the concerns. And the second concern is that it produces a significant heat load in the coolant itself. Um, bismuth is considerably more expensive than lead, and its limited availability may inhibit large-scale deployment of reactors cooled by lead bismuth uh, eutectic. And so there, there's a series of advantages and disadvantages for each of these coolant types uh, that must be considered by designers. Uh, note that each of the Generation 4 International Forum reference designs that I'll talk about later feature lead as the coolant, but several other reactor designs being actively pursued, uh, you know, focus on lead bismuth eutectic. To summarize this part of the discussion, uh, lead-cooled fast reactors have the potential to excel in safety for reasons outlined on this slide. First is the very high boiling point of lead. As I said before, 1,737 degrees centigrade, uh, or, or for uh, lead bismuth eutectic, for that matter. And this allows reactor operation uh, at or near uh, atmospheric pressure, and it virtually eliminates the risk of core voiding due to boiling, uh, the boiling of the coolant. 
Second is the lack of rapid chemical reactions between lead and either water or air. There are no energetic releases or hydrogen production from chemical reactions. The use of water as an ultimate heat removal fluid is, is conceivable should other heat removal systems fail. Third, the thermal capacity of lead combined with the large mass of coolant means that there is significant thermal inertia in the event of hypothetical accident initiators. And there are long grace times for operator invention in the event of an op upset condition. Next, lead is an effective shield against gamma radiation and it retains iodine and cesium, as well as other radionuclides at temperatures up to 600 degrees centigrade or higher. This results in a significantly reduced potential source term in case of fuel failure and contributes to enhanced defense in depth. Finally, the low nu neutron moderation of lead allows greater fuel spacing without excessively penalizing neutronic performance. This results in reduced risk of flow blockage and reduced core pressure drop while enabling a simple co coolant flow path to allow operational and decay heat re uh, to be removed through natural circulation. This chart summarizes the results of a presentation by the well-known Russian scientist, Professor Georgi Toshinsky, in which he calculated the stored energy in three different reactor coolants, water, sodium, and lead, or LBE. With his assumed operational parameters, he calculated the total potential energy in gigajoules per cubic meter for each of these coolants, taking into account the, the thermal energy stored in the coolant, the energy of pressurization, the potential chemical energy of interaction with zirconium, water, or air, and the potential secondary chemical energy resulting from the interaction of released hydrogen with air. The bottom line is that water as a coolant presents 21.9 uh, gigajoules per cubic meter of stored energy. Sodium, less than half of that figure, at 10 gigajoules per cubic meter, and led a further reduction of about an order of magnitude down to 1.09 gigajoules per cubic meter of stored energy. The very low comparative amount of stored energy in lead-cooled fast reactor coolants is another indication of their enhanced safety potential based on intrinsic properties of the coolant. Now let's shift to the Generation 4 International Forum, or GIF. GIF was formed in 2001 by a group of nine countries to develop future generation advanced nuclear energy systems. Subsequently, several addition, additional countries joined the organization, and membership now stands at 14 countries. In 2002, the GIF published the technical, uh, technology roadmap document, which is shown here at the right side of this chart. Six Generation 4 advanced nuclear energy systems, uh, as shown on this table, were identified as having good promise. And three out of the six systems, the GFR, the LFR, and the SFR, are fast reactors. In addition, the molten salt reactor and the supercritical water reactor also have considered fast spectrum options. The 2002 GIF roadmap included projected timelines for the various development phases for each reactor type, and that is shown on the left of this slide. Note that the three phases shown by different colors indicate the viability phase in orange, addressing the question, are there any showstoppers? The performance phase in yellow, focusing on testing, and the demonstration phase in gray, indicating design, construction, and operation of demonstration reactor. The graph on the right shows the projections as of an update to the roadmap completed in 2013. It's interesting to note the key transition from the performance phase, yellow, to the demonstration phase, gray. In each case, the timeline for this transition was extended going from 2002 to 2013 by five to 10 years, except for the case of the lead-cooled fast reactor which shows uh, a one-year extension from the original pro projection. This was mainly the result of the Russian efforts to build the Brest OD300 demonstration reactor, which I'll describe later, scheduled for operation in 2021. 
So you can see that the lead-cooled fast reactor is now the Generation 4 system with the earliest projected demonstration. The bottom line is that LFR technology readiness is higher than generally thought. With respect to the lead-cooled fast reactor status within GIF, a provisional system steering committee was first formed in 2005. Its members included the European Union, the United States, Japan, and Korea. The committee prepared an initial draft LFR system research plan, or SRP. Then in 2010, a memorandum of understanding, or MOU, was created and signed uh, between the European Union and Japan, formalizing the LFR steering committee. In 2011, the Russian Federation added its signature to the MOU, resulting in a revision and augmentation of the system re uh, research plan. In 2015, Korea became a full member by adding its signature to the MOU. And at present, the United States and China participate in active observer status. Within the SRP, there are three reference systems adopted by the committee, and they include the European Lead uh, Fast Reactor, or ELFR, Helfer, which is a large central station 600 megawatt electric reactor. Second, the Brest OD300, which is a demonstration reactor of intermediate size at 300 megawatts electric. And the SDAR 20 megawatt electric system, a transportable uh, small modular system, or SMR. I'll provide a brief overview of each of these reference systems in turn. The first of these reference systems is the European Lead Fast Reactor, or ELFR. This is a 600 megawatt electric pool type central station lead cooled fast reactor, which is cooled by pure lead at a coolant temperature cycle of 400 to 480 centigrade. It features removable steam generator pump assemblies and operates at a power conversion efficiency of 42%. The fuel is mixed oxide fuel and it uses uh, two-dimensional seismic isolation to provide earthquake potential uh, protection. Please also note that associated with ALFR is a smaller demonstration reactor known as ALFRD, uh, which, uh, which would operate at 125 megawatts of electric. Here you see a sketch of the ALFRD demonstration reactor, which is a scaled-down version of ALFR. Alfred has a power rating of 125 megawatts electric, and in common with Alfred, Alfred uses the coolant temperature cycle of 400 to 480 centigrade, as well as many other components and features in common with Alfred. Next, let's consider the LFR initiatives in Russia. It was Russian, or perhaps more correctly, Soviet military applications that led eventually to the current LFR developments in Russia. And this provided a very rich knowledge and experience base leading to its current commercial reactor initiatives. This background started as early as 1951 with testing facilities and led to the deployment of a series of submarines and ground-based reactors cooled by LBE. In all, this experience base amounted to about 80 reactor years of uh, operating experience with many lessons learned along the way. Ongoing developments in Russia include the two systems on the right, the SVBR-100 and the Brest OD-300 reactors. The SVBR-100 is perhaps the reactor type most directly following the Russian submarine experience, as it is a small reactor cooled by lead bismuth eutectic. The Brest OD-300 is the second reference system in the GIF program, which we'll take a look at next. So the Brest OD300 is a prototype for a commercial LFR. It operates at a power of 300 megawatts electric and uses pure lead as the coolant. It operates at a 420 to 535 degree centigrade temperature cycle. The fuel material is uranium plutonium nitride, and it has a power conversion efficiency of 43.5%. A couple of additional notable features are the unique concrete steel reactor vessel, which creates a hybrid pool loop type arrangement, and the plan to associate a pyrochemical fuel reprocessing facility with the reactor. 
I'll also note that the Brest OD300 reactor is a demonstration system as a prototype, but that also uh, there is a much larger follow-on system, the Brest 1200, that, which has been envisioned. One of the first concepts for a small modular reactor, or, or SMR, is the Small Secure Transportable Autonomous Reactor, or SSTAR, which was developed in the US by a team of national laboratories and universities. Uh, on this slide are some sketches and article headlines describing early versions of the concept well before the current global interest in SMRs emerged. The SSTAR concept is now a legacy design, work having concluded on it several years ago. Um, it has been retained as a GIF reference system to represent potential SMR applications. SSTAR is a small natural circulation LFR of 20 megawatt electric output, operating on a 420 to 567 degree centigrade temperature cycle. It uses nitride fuel in which the nitride is enriched in nitrogen 15. It features the use of natural convection coolant circulation for both operational and shutdown heat removal. Power conversion is by a supercritical CO2 Brayton cycle, and this provides an efficiency of about 44%. The concept envisions a long life sealed core in a small transportable system. So as a recap, this table summarizes some of the key parameters for these three reference systems with thermal and electric power levels, primary system types, coolant temperature cycles, power conversion and efficiency for each of the uh, reference concepts. The intent of including these multiple concepts as reference LFR systems is to represent a full range of power ratings and application types. This table, as the, with the rest of the presentation, uh, will be available for download following the webinar. In addition to the three reference system, there are several other concepts being currently considered or developed by commercial interests, laboratories, and universities internationally. And this is an indication of the diverse international interest in the LFR technology and the potential for innovation in design. This slide shows a selection of these initiatives, including the Hydromine AS200, a 200 megawatt electric system being developed by the US company Hydromine in concert with their design team in Italy. The lead cold sealer reactor originated in uh, Sweden and being developed in Canada. Clear One, a 10 megawatt system being developed in China. Uranus, a Korean design out of Seoul National University and the Westinghouse LFR. Uh, we'll now take a quick look at each of these concepts before concluding. The Hydromine AS200 is a highly compact 200 megawatt electric LFR, where the compactness has been achieved mainly by creative design and elimination of components traditionally included in metal-cooled fast reactors. Uh, for example, the concept is four times more compact than the Superphenix sodium fast reactor, uh, and it's two to five times more compact than other more advanced metal-cooled fast reactors uh, that uh, are in the design space now. It uses oxide fuel, a 420 to 530 degree centigrade temperature cycle, and the coolant is pure lead. The Hydromine AS200 was first publicly presented to the international community at a symposium held at Imperial College in London in July of 2016. The lead cold sealer reactor is a very small uh, 3 to 10 megawatt electric uh, lead bismuth eutectic cooled reactor being developed for applications in Canada and elsewhere. Initially intended for commercial production of electricity in communities and mining operations in the Canadian Arctic. It uses oxide fuel and a low temperature operation below 450 centigrade with a long core life of 10 to 30 years. It was designed to be the smallest possible reactor core that can achieve criticality in a fast spectrum using 19.9% .9 enriched uranium oxide fuel. 
It's a system that would be transportable to and from its operating site. Earlier this year, Lead Cold received a $200 million in funding from the ESSEL Group Middle East to enable licensing and construction of a demonstration reactor in Canada. The Clear One reactor, under development by the Chinese Academy of Sciences, is a uh, very small system of 10 megawatt uh, thermal power cooled by lead bismuth eutectic. It's, de it is, it's designed to operate in a subcritical accelerator-driven mode or as a critical system. It's fu fueled by uranium oxide and uses natural circulation for operational and shutdown heat removal. Its temperature cycle is the very low 260 to 390 degrees centigrade. Thus far, a detailed conceptual design of Clear One is complete, and the preliminary engineering design is underway. The Korean Uranus reactor is a 50 megawatt electric lead-cooled system using natural circulation cooling and operating on a temperature cycle of 400 to 520 degrees centigrade. Uranus features 3D seismic isolation, underground siting, and a 20-year refueling cycle. And as I said before, it's being uh, uh, designed and developed at the Seoul National University in Korea. The Westinghouse LFR is a concept under active development and for which I can't provide detailed specifications beyond the sketch here. However, it's worthwhile to point out that this in, um, initiative is the result of a comprehensive independent evaluation several years ago of next generation advanced reactor technologies. Westinghouse selected the LFR as the technology having the greatest potential to meet key requirements of safety, economics, and marketability. Also considered was sustainability and technology readiness, and a clean sheet approach was used. There's no legacy from the past. Some of the key elements of their assessment included the potential for plant simplification from atmospheric pressure operation, the fact that there are no significant sources for contain, uh, containment pressurization, and there are no boiling concerns, a strong safety case, and sufficient technology readiness. Their assessment identified several favorable economic indicators resulting from enhanced safety of the LFR uh, systems, including, first, the expectation of reduced capital cost from the plant simplification based on a reduced number of components from a primary system operating at atmospheric pressure, the potential elimination of an intermediate circuit, a small and, and easier or faster to build containment due to the lack of significant sources of pressurization, and the lack of a need for special provisions, systems, and components to protect the plant from coolant leakages and coolant water or air interactions. Second, the expectation of high plant efficiency. The large margin to boiling makes LFR efficiency dependent on progress in materials and therefore higher temperature operations rather than on coolant boiling concerns. Third, the high power density from the use of a liquid metal coolant. And finally, a strong case for a reduced emergency planning zone uh, based on a reduced source term as a result of a large margin to boiling, a high thermal capacity, reduced likelihood for a loss of coolant or LOCA, uh, loss of coolant accident, and the use of a chemically benign coolant coupled with lead's ability to retain radionuclides. And so in conclusion, there's a clear growing international interest in LFR technology. Some factors for this include excellent sustainability from full utilization of uranium resources, reduced nuclear waste concerns, due to the ability to consume minor actinides and utilize accumulated plutonium as fuel, uh, an outstanding safety case, and promising economics from lead's inherent attributes combined with proper design. So these are some, uh, some of the main drivers of this international interest. I leave you with this table for future reference, which summarizes the array of potential operating and design parameters of LFR systems describing some power-related characteristics, thermal hydraulic pr parameters, and materials. And this should remain uh, available as part of the downloadable presentation material. And similarly, 
this is a short list of some selected reference materials, uh, which will also remain available in the downloaded uh, webinar material. And with that, I will conclude my presentation. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Smith. We appreciate your time and pulling together these slides. Um, again, we apologize for the technical difficulties with our audio and <clears throat> appreciate um, you hanging in with us to, to make your presentation. Um, Amanda, if you are on, I have been dropped from the host. I need to be elevated. I cannot see the questions um, coming in to help facilitate that. If you have questions for Dr. Smith, you can post them in the Q&A pod, um, and we will take as many of those questions as we have time right now. Uh, upcoming webinars in July, Do, uh, Dr. Mikkel uh, Sendis with OECDA, OECD NEA um, from France will present on the thorium fuel cycle. In August, a presentation by Dr. Stephen Hayes with INL in the USA will pre present on nuclear fuels and materials. And in September, uh, energy conversion by Dr. Richard Tansy. So I don't see questions. Um, I do see a comment. Uh, Craig, if you toggle between on the Q&A pod between the presenter and the participant view, you'll be able to see those questions. Oops, I apologize. Come in. The first question, what is the performance difference between UO2 and UN? fuel in the LFR? Okay, yes. Uh, uh, uranium oxide is a, um, uh, a fuel that is uh, commonly used for uh, thermal reactors, for uh, light water reactors, and, but also for uh, fast reactors, for sodium fast reactors. It's a, a considered a, a fuel that's very, very well known and very well characterized. Uranium uh, nitride fuel is a fuel that has uh, is, uh, some characteristics that are um, beneficial both in terms of the um, operation of the reactor, uh, namely it has a superior thermal con conductivity characteristics that, uh, uh, that, that help in the thermal hydraulic performance of a reactor. And then secondly, for um, purposes of um, uh, reprocessing or recycle of um, uh, spent nuclear fuel, uh, there are uh, some significant advantages with the uranium nitride uh, fuel um, in moving from uh, kind of the wet chemistry fuel reprocessing to uh, pyrochemical uh, processing. So um, both oxide fuels and nitride fuels are uh, incorporated into the designs of LFRs. Um, I would say that the nitride fuel is considered to be uh, more of a, f a fuel for higher temperature operation in the future. Um, and uh, Oxide um, fuels are the uh, safer bets in, in terms of fuel qualification uh, to remove obstacles for near-term uh, de development and deployment. Having said that, I would point out that the first demonstration reactor uh, in the Gen 4 program is the REST OD300 reactor, uh, which is uh, fueled by a nitride fuel. So, uh, uh, so the nitride fuel is not uh, necessarily that far out in the future. It's, uh, it's one that will be appearing in an early uh, deployment of the LFR. Yeah, so the second uh, question here uh, has to do with silicon carbide materials, um, which are uh, receiving attention for advanced light water reactor uh, and are being researched extensively. Uh, I, I, do, I do think that there um, is potential for uh, lead or LBE systems of silicon carbide, and I understand that this is a material that is being considered for some applications. Uh, and um, uh, again, it's, it's, it's probably a material which is uh, uh, you know, further out in the future, but getting to materials that can operate um, uh, in a higher temperature regime uh, is uh, very interesting and, and important because, as I said uh, in the presentation, the obstacle um, to higher temperature um, operation, you know, lies in materials uh, for, uh, 
the lead cooled fast reactor. Unlike other reactors where uh, a margin to boiling might be a, a, a bigger consideration or an increased pressurization. Uh, for the LFR, I think as you can move to higher temperature operations, you will improve uh, performance and materials is the key. Um, so another question is, will the higher, higher temperature improve electricity um, produ production? And I think the real answer there is that uh, there's a uh, direct relationship between the temperature of operation and the efficiency of uh, power conversion. And so by improving uh, the efficiency of output, uh, you know, you improve the economics and the, the quantity of, um, of electrical output uh, uh, for a given amount of f uh, fuel that you consume. And so um, the, um, uh, so I think the answer is that uh, uh, yes, this would be a significant improvement and it really indicates an upside potential. Uh, in the one calculation that I showed uh, comparing uh, thermal reactor systems to fast reactor systems for uh, the UK, uh, you noted that the quantity of uh, fission product um, uh, residue uh, was dramatically reduced in going to the LFR, and that's primarily due to the higher temperature operation, the improved uh, efficiency going from some, some efficiency in the, in the low 30s uh, percent up to uh, the, the low 40s, and uh, that can have a significant impact uh, in uh, the um, efficiency of the uh, operating system. Um, so um, the purity level for um, nitrogen 15, uh, you know, I think there, there are two nitride fueled systems that I talked about, and the, nitrogen the use of nitrogen 15 is uh, included in the S-star reactor for purposes of improving, nitri uh, improving neutron uh, performance and uh, the neutronics. And uh, so the level of purity does not need to be uh, extreme. Um, and uh, uh, I'll say that on the one hand, but then I'll also say that the, uh, the Russian breast system with uh, nitride fuel uses, uh, uses a, a normal uh, isotopic mix of uh, nitrogen. And so uh, it's basically a design choice uh, that is made in looking at nitride fuels, whether you go with the uh, isotopically enriched version or uh, the conventional version. Um, you can do either one, and there are pros and cons of each. So the Russian, um, the, the question is, are, are the Russians still using ferritic steel, uh, stainless with oxide coating, uh, not ASA steel? Um, uh, so I, I don't have the up-to-the-minute uh, answer to that question, but uh, uh, the, the Russian design uh, relies heavily on um, the um, uh, control of oxygen uh, content in the coolant to maintain uh, the, the oxide um, coating on their components. And, um, and I believe it's a silicon-enhanced uh, uh, steel that they're using. Um, but uh, they, they rely very heavily on uh, oxygen control. And, uh, and then I, I would say that uh, there are other systems that are being looked at uh, where oxygen control is not the primary um, approach. Uh, if the temperature is kept low enough, then one can uh, use um, uh, you know, a, a coolant that has uh, very little oxygen uh, in it because the corrosion processes don't uh, really kick in until you get uh, above a certain threshold. And I think that's the last question I have. Um, if others have questions uh, after the seminar, uh, after the webinar, um, you know, please feel free to uh, shoot me an email. I'd be happy to um, uh, open a discussion. So it looks like there are two more questions. Yes. So there's a question that says, have sufficient tests been made on nitride fuels? I, I know that the nitride fuels, uh, the fuel concepts for the, breast, the Russian breast system is, um, um, is, is, is ongoing, and uh, they are in the process of actually testing their nitride fuels. And they're on a, um, a 
a very tight schedule, as you, uh, as I indicated before. Um, their their current stage is that they have uh, completed their design and they're awaiting uh, construction uh, approval from their um, their uh, regulatory authorities. Uh, this as we speak, uh, with the plan to begin construction and then operation by uh, 2021. Uh, so uh, they will have completed all the tests that they. Uh, that they deem necessary on nitride fuels, and those tests are ongoing. Okay, so um, the, 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 the question here is uh, the distinction between uh, built technologies and, uh, and, and plans from proposed evolution of designs, and, uh, you know, asking for the referenced uh, LFR concepts um, are their concrete plans and funding. And uh, so there are three uh, reference designs that I had mentioned. Um, uh, one of them is the uh, breast uh, uh, system, which uh, I just described the current status of, of that uh, uh, project. Uh, it, it's certainly very concrete with funding in place and um, at the uh, uh, at the verge of going forward with uh, com uh, completion of construction based on uh, their full design and so on. Uh, in the case of the uh, European lead fast reactor, uh, it's more preliminary and uh, not all funding is in place. Uh, it has been funded over the years incrementally um, and uh, there is uh, an active effort to uh, move forward uh, with uh, with, the, with this project, particularly the demonstrator, um, which would be, as my understanding at this point, which would be sited in uh, Romania. And uh, I understand that there uh, is either funding lined up or the expectation of infrastructure uh, funding to support at least a part of that. So, uh, so I would say that with the European lead fast reactor, uh, it's in an intermediate state uh, where uh, not all funding has been secured. Uh, but the design work has continued, and uh, and it's uh, seeking uh, funding to firm things up. And then with the um, S-Star uh, re small reactor I mentioned, uh, that's kind of the other extreme. And I, as I said in the presentation, it's a legacy system. It's a system that went through con uh, conceptual design, um, and then basically was uh, uh, you know put on the shelf as a, a, a it's, it's adopted as a reference system. Center. Please hold while I confirm your passcode. Thank you. Your passcode is confirmed. When you hear the tone, you will be the fifth person to join the meeting. Craig, we dropped off that audio um, mid-answer. Um, you got up to about the um, SR reactor, and I apologize when that notification popped in. Okay. Uh, are we? Are, uh, uh, do you want me to, to go back and reconstruct that? On a second. Let me make sure that we are broadcasting. We are broadcasting, and we are. So, um, yeah. If you wanted to, it was the third reactor. I think okay. we kind of got cut off. Sure. So I understand that the sound was cut off on the response to that last question uh, part way through. Um, uh, I had mentioned the status of uh, the Breast 300 and uh, Alpha reactor, and I began to say that for S-Star, the uh, which is the third of the three reference systems 
the, um, the, the status is, as I mentioned in the presentation, that this is a legacy system. It's a system that uh, the, the initial work of uh, conceptualizing uh, the design was completed, and, uh, uh, and then the, the design put on the shelf, and that further development has not been continued uh, on that system, and it occupies uh, a place on the GIF list of reference reactors uh, as, uh, I, I guess, more of a placeholder than anything else to basically represent the, uh, the space for uh, small modular reactors, which is rec recognized as a promising um, uh, segment uh, for uh, GIF systems. So that's the three reference systems. They're very, in very different stages of uh, development uh, and commitment of funding. I would say that in the additional systems that I mentioned, each one of them has uh, d differing levels of uh, uh, design teams that are uh, very active in pursuing the respective designs and, and with the appropriate funding to uh, carry out their design activities. Uh, in particular, the lead cold reactor um, it w received uh, an infusion of funding uh, intended to um, support its efforts to carry it through finalization of design and demonstration in Canada, a $200 million in, in investment um, in, in that concept. And so, uh, so that one maybe uh, uh, stands out in terms of uh, securing of uh, funding to carry uh, that additional system forward. But I, but I would say the, uh, the systems in Korea and in China, the hydromine system and the Westinghouse uh, act activity are, are uh, very active with um, uh, design teams uh, uh, working at it and with the appropriate level of uh, funding secured to continue their design activity. Um, and I hope that answers the question. Great, thank you. I don't see additional questions. Um, if there are any other questions, go ahead and type them in now. And again, my apologies for the technical issues this morning. I do appreciate everyone's patience um, as we work through those, setting up another meeting room. Uh, these things happen periodically. Thank you, goodness, not very often. We've had a, quite a run of uh, successful webinars without technical issues. This presentation was recorded and will be posted on the, um, the GIF website with the slide uh, deck as PDFs for future reference. Um, if there are no additional questions at this time uh, for Dr. Smith, then um, I think we will conclude the presentation. I uh, wish you all a good and safe day. And thanks again, Dr. Smith, for your um, marvelous information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Bye. Thank you, Patricia.